Welcome along, everyone. Um, on the third of the uh, Melbourne Osaka boat preparation sessions run by the ORCV. Um, we're going to record it if those are not familiar. The way we interact on the night is through the chat function. It's just a, like a little messaging service. I'll be on the other end and if they're simple questions, try and answer them. Otherwise, I'll queue them up and then at the end of each um, presenter's um, bit, there'll be an opportunity for those questions. I'm just getting a few people coming through. Um, maybe if someone, I will just let them in, just pause a moment. We've got Christian Kenfield. Um, we've got Daryl Gregg. And we've got Maud. Martin, if you'd like, I'll if, mark. If you could, yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Um, leave your video off, it just affects the bandwidth if you wanna keep the, um, the audio as clear as you can. Um, and hopefully everyone can see the screen. If anyone can't see the screen, let us know through the mute, uh, the chat function, and um, we will try and help you offline. So the presenters and topics tonight, I'm moderating, so I'm not going to be speaking at all. Uh, Rod Smallman is going to be presenting on navigating, forecasting, and the weather. Paul Roberts is going to be presenting on the notice of race and updates and compliance reminders to that. Um, Blake. Anderson is a guest who's coming from Doyle Sales, and he'll be talking about sales selection and uh, management systems. Paul's going to then come back in and just talk about a few luxuries, um, and that's just to get you thinking. And we're going to be wrapped up by Simon Dryden, who's going to be talking about rigging. So at the end of each of those speakers' spots, there'll be a little opportunity to ask questions and get clarifications and that sort of thing. So without further ado, I'm just going to rip into it and I'm going to hand over to Rod Smallman. So Rod, can you just verify you've got control? Hello, oh, Rod. Yes, I do. Thank you, Martin. Excellent. Hopefully that dinner is tasty. Uh, the, what? Tasty? No, That's actually, not my so dinner. Said, uh, That's it's all right. Someone else is. I'm going to mute them. So anyway, sure. over to you. Uh, well, uh, welcome everybody for my little bit. Um, so tonight I'm going to talk about uh, uh, the course and I uh, just want to talk about a few things uh, along the course that I just want to highlight. And then we're going to morph into what you should, could and should expect um, from a weather point of view and, and where the course might take you and things that might help you decide which way you're going to go. Um, so the overview of the course is that, yeah, we go from Melbourne to Osaka. Um, so we're going out of the waters of Port Phillip Bay through Bass Strait, Tasman Sea, Coral Sea, Solomon Sea, and maybe the Bismarck Sea, although I'm not sure that anyone's gone along the Bismarck Sea. Definitely haven't gone on the podium on it. North Pacific Ocean and then Osaka Bay. Um, so there's a couple of things that I'd like to highlight. Um, the first thing, uh, the exclusion zones, and there's three of those. Uh, there's the OICB exclusion zone at Port Phillip Heads. Uh, and as far as I'm aware, and I'll actually get Simon to uh, to verify this potentially later on, where there's likely to be a buoy uh, at Shortland Bluff, which is uh, below the, um, the lighthouses at Queenscliff, uh, and it's the northern end of that exclusion zone. The southern end, which is the heads clearing, is uh, definitely going to be a virtual mark. Um, the next uh, the next exclusion zone is uh, to the right of Okinoshima, and hopefully I got that right, George. Um, it's the Yurashido. It's the entrance into Osaka Bay, um, so you're not uh, you're not to go. Uh, you've got to leave that to port um, and go through the Yurashido. And the final exclusion zone is the uh, the Kenzai Airport. So you can't go inside that. Um, and for those who have done or looked at uh, previous notice of races, we've extended that exclusion zone out to sort of like the, the no-go zones at the end of the, uh, the runways there. Uh, the next thing I'd like to uh, talk about as well, uh, the traffic separation schemes um, and there's three of them that are likely to be right on your rum line. The first one is underneath Wilson's Prom um, and that's the uh, the top right image here 
Um, there's plenty of water in between Wilson's Prom and the northern end of, or the northern side of the TSS under Wilson's Prom. But if you find yourself um, uh, tacking or driving down there and you find yourself sort of in a more southern position, then you need to go underneath uh, Rodondo Island there and stay in uh, in the traffic separation schemes. Even though these things are designed for big ships, um, the coal wrecks still save vessels, so that's us. And there's a couple of two-way routes uh, if you find yourself on the western side of the Coral Sea um, that you you might need to uh, do some research on, especially if you're going to go into the Louise Yards, and I'll talk about that in a tick. Um, where are we? Where are we? Where are we? Yeah, now we get to the Solomon Sea. Um, so the big black line there is 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 the main rum line, but it is uh, navigable through plenty of passages through the Solomon Islands, uh, and I've circled there the Louise Yards, which there's a lot of stuff in there, but it is navigable if you find yourself more west than uh, than you want it to be, um, although the accepted rum line is, as I say, through that black line. And um, also, if you wanted to go into the Bismarck Sea, um, it it is navigable through there. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to talk about potential reasons why you want to go through each of these things. Uh, and we'll talk about it in a minute. The next thing I wanted to highlight is um, the direction of voyage. You can see on the image that's there, uh, we're green. So uh, our voyage is uh, green on the right and red on the left in region A, but Japan and the Americas are different. So just bear that in mind when you're going into uh, into J Japanese waters that the voyage is, uh, they drive on the wrong side of the road. Uh, another thing that I wanted to to highlight um and this is um is this is something whether you're using ENCs, whether you're using um cmap or navionics or even paper charts is the accuracy of the charts that uh that you're going to uh, have through most of your course uh the circle here is around the caroline islands and and, and the chances are that you are going to go directly through the caroline islands and if we just um, drill on down to one of these uh, atolls that you're likely to go past, there's an island here called Ulul Island. And correct me if I'm wrong, George, but that's how I'm going to pronounce it anyway. Um, part of your requirements um, for documentation, you know, apart from charts, is also to have the sailing directions on board. If we have all of the sailing directions of Ulul Island, um, the bit down the bottom that's highlighted is uh, the bit that's intriguing to me, is in that uh, the island in 1993 was to, reported to lie 1.5 miles southeast of its charter position. So that's in the current sailing directions for 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 that area. And um, uh, Rod, if I could just uh, check with you there, uh, I know that island very well. It's an atoll. Uh, we had to take shelter there in the uh, the typhoon in 2003, and there was a Taiwanese shipping bo boat that uh, ignored the uh, the charts and ploughed on, and it uh, we saw it on the shore when we arrived there. So it's uh, it's an uh, area re you really have to watch. Um, thanks, George. Yeah, nice little um, beach ornament there. Um, yes, and this is what I wanted to highlight. So the thing about um, official charts is they have this thing called zone of confidence. And the, the image that I've got it there at the moment, it's the same image, but I've, I've just opened up uh, there that it's a, it's a two-star zone of confidence. And 80% of the racetrack that you're going to go through from Melbourne to Osaka is two stars or less. And if we have a look at the, the zone of confidence um, for the positional accuracy, not worry too much about the depth accuracy, but the positional accuracy, um, you know, starts with A1, which might be the South Channel, and and they're, they're doing that all the time because of the shipping. But um, the rest of the place uh, is, is category C and D. So category C 
the accuracy that the official chart makers are saying is plus or minus 500 meters positional accuracy possible error and then they're saying zone d is worse than c and what all i want to point out to you there is it doesn't matter what charts you you're using and as george said that uh, that fishing boat uh, ignored uh, the positional accuracy of their chart at their peril um so if you're going through these islands in the middle of the night give them a good berth because they might be not where you think they are um and just bear that in mind also with the positional accuracy of your gps um so if you this image here is showing a charted shoal give it the birth of the zone of confidence and also give it the birth of your positional accuracy as well with your gps it's okay during the day because you can see these things but um you're going into territory there and i was quite surprised to hear a few years ago that some of Captain Cook's soundings are still on the chart. Um, somebody can potentially turn their... That might be you, Ken Goulet. If you can yes. turn your, um, your mic off, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, so that's sort of what I wanted to talk to you about the charts. And the other thing I also wanted to talk to you about the charts, and, and particularly ele electronic charts, in particular, you know, there's a couple of cool things you can do with your charts. One here, uh, uh, I've got the Solomon Islands up. Then what I did is I went and got the heat map from uh, Marine Traffic to show you where all the major shipping is. And I took an image of that and I geo-referenced it onto my own charts there. And if you have a look on the, on the side of here, you can see parts of New Guinea where my mouse is wandering over. And then I traced it. Uh, and then after a while, I've taken the image away, and now I've got um, the uh, the shipping lanes on my chart. And you know, you, you might not think it's uh, uh, it's that important, but you might need it one day. And we we're talking about this before. These shipping lanes are a really good source of help. You know, if you're uh, if you're needing help, um, and if you're already prepared for it, you don't have to worry in an emergency. Um, so this is they're the great things about uh, about it. electronic charts now that you can do a lot of this preparation before you even leave. So moving on now, um, oh, I did want to talk about this. We've been talking with um, with boat books uh, about and what they've done for us is they've put together a single link purchase option for the for your E and C charts. And we'll give you that link uh, soonish, as soon as they give it to us, uh, where you can essentially just jump on their website and with one click buy all your all your charts. Um, we've changed the publications now from uh, a requirement of uh, the Admiralty uh, sailing directions to free downloads um, through the uh, the MSI NOAA site from from America. Um, that information is shared information, so it's exactly the same, and it's probably a little bit more comprehensive coming through um, coming through the NOAA sign. But we'll give you those links very, very soon. I'll, I'll talk, it's Rod, it's Paul there. I'll, I've got a NOR update coming up as part of the presentation. We'll further talk about that. Sure. Okay, thank you. So now moving on to the weather, and I guess uh, the weather is going to start to dictate where you're going to head on your course. You're essentially going to go through seven different weather zones from the southern uh, temperate zone, which is where we are in Melbourne, um, into the southeast trades, the northeast trades, and the northern temperates. Um, but in between, you've got these transitional zones. Um, and in the north and the south, you've got what they call the horse doldrums, sorry, the horse latitudes. And then right in the middle is the ITCZ, which is the doldrums. Um, and these are the things that uh, you're going to calculate as to how you're going to cross them and where you're going to cross them. And so I thought I'd give you a little bit of information to help you do that. Now, wouldn't it be great if they were just straight lines? So we're going to cross over 30 degrees south and we're straight into the southeast trades. But we all know that that's quite uh, not the case. And there's a lot of um, oscillation of these um, of these zones, 
not only on a daily basis, but also on a seasonal basis. And, and uh, this next image here shows the location of the doldrums um, from our summer to our winter. And I was quite surprised how north the doldrums go in the western part of the Pacific. Um, so it's a really good idea to have a look through this and see how the weather's going to, uh, to dictate where you're going to go through. There's a couple of major... Uh, weather, I don't know, things. I'm not really technical on that. The first one that I wanted to talk about is the Enzo cycle. And it's fairly well known that the trade winds in a La Nina year are much stronger and extend much further west uh, than they do in a El Nino year. So you might find that there's no wind where you want to go because it's a, an El Nino year um, as opposed to a La Nina year. And you already know that before you leave. So that might help you decide which direction you're going to go, particularly when you're going to transit the Solomons. Um, the other weather phenomenon is um, the Madden-Julian Oscillation, which starts in the, uh, in the Indian Ocean. And those two have quite a substantial um, influence on the weather in the Western Pacific, exactly where you're going. Um, and it's, it's, it's well worth looking at to decide, you know, what sort of winds you're likely to expect as to which way you're going to go on the race course. Uh, so this particular image is, uh, is a sea pilot chart and it gives the average wind for that particular part of the world for every month of the year. And you can download these um, from the NOAA site. Um, and there's actually an app that you can route with these things. And I did it last time we, we, we went. And, and the, the route that came up from these average weather conditions was right along the rum line that's, that's widely publicised as, as, as the route to go. Well, the other thing that you can do is... is um, Go and get some historical weather, which which I've done for this presentation. So what I did is I've gone and downloaded 25 years of historical weather, and then I've done a weather a, 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 a route from Melbourne to Osaka for four times a day, so every six hours for seven days every year. And the reason why I've done it for seven days is so that a full weather cycle can trundle all the way through, because what we're trying to do here is get an, a good look at what you might get on the racetrack. Um, and that, is, that uh, turned out just to be 700 routes. So I did 700 weather routes um, for Osaka, starting at, 20, at, at 2000 and going through to 2024 this year. And I do want to note that this is wind only and there's no current because um, – I couldn't get historical current groups. That was the reason why. So 700 routes. Uh, this is a, let's call it a 40-foot boat. I, I, I tried to pick an average of, of what you might be. And, and, and uh, in your preparation, you might actually do this for your own boat to get an idea. So uh, longest time, 30 days. Uh, shortest time, 23 days. Last time, I think we took about 35 five days for us um, and the end result is that the racetrack now looks a lot wider than you might think because uh, this is the fastest track uh, for 700 different conditions of weather that you're likely to get around about March. So what I did is, uh, is I got the start date and I just went three days either side of that. And if I then take that, the extremity of the of, of where the weather's likely to take you, your racetrack in the southern end of the northern Pacific is potentially 1,300 nautical miles wide. So when you're doing your, um, uh, your research on your possible track, you might not think that you're going there, but the weather might dictate that you go there. Um, and uh, you might end up 
uh, way, way different to where you thought. So my recommendation for this is with these, uh, with your preparation, potentially go a bit wider than just what the rum line's saying. Then if we have a look at uh, some of these routes, uh, and again, depending on the wind, you might find yourself way south, uh, just trying to tack to get out of Bass Strait. Uh, last time the race was held, we were lucky. We had westerlies and we pounded out of there. Um, and again, I, I, want, I want to highlight that this has uh, no current in it. Um, and it's here tonight. So in the last race, a lot of us uh, hugged the corner here. Uh, Annette and her husband, Jerry, in red jacket, went out in the middle of Bass Strait, caught a big eddy here and pantsed us uh, and were well ahead of us uh, by the time they got uh, um, level with Brisbane. So the currents here are critical if, you, if you're going, uh, you know, for the podium end. Um, so then what I've done is is these are, I've highlighted going through the Solomon Islands. Um, and again, go back and have a think about uh, going through the um, uh, the main rum line um, between Bougainville and uh, and New Guinea. But there's four or five other options that you could potentially go. Um, and if you have, if you have a look at uh, the far, East routes, which take you right outside the Solomons. Uh, I know that there was a boat a couple of editions ago that won by going out there. Why would you go out there? Well, perhaps it's a strong La Nina year or El Nino or, or whatever it is. But if you're going to go out there, you need to be making up your mind off Sydney um, because uh, you don't want to be sort of taking – a sharp right turn at the Louise Yards and then go out there. So this is a, a long-term strategy that you might think about. But each and every one of these routes for that exact moment in time was the fastest way to get to Osaka. Um, so I wanted to point that out. Now, if we take those 700 routes and put them together and create our own little heat map here, this table shows the amount of time, so the, the, the average time to get to a sarcop for this boat is 642 hours. Um, and the average times that you'll be in certain conditions. So if we just take a, a random number here, if if we can see our mouse of 15.81. So that's a, ran, a, um, a random time over there, 700 routes, that you're likely to be close hauled in 12 knots of breeze. And if we have a look at our heat map, you're likely to be in six to 20 knots for 85% of the time. And for 50% of the time, you're likely to be um, reaching running. Uh, and the other thing of, of, of note as well is for nearly 20% of the time, you're likely to be close hauled as well. There was an incident, I think 2.13, where a boat optimised their position because they believed it to be a reaching running race for they optimised their entire boat for that and they had very, very little jibs. And when they found themselves on the schnoz for that amount of time, they sort of went out the back door. Now, I'm not quite sure if Blake's here at the moment, but um, I'd be interested in your opinion, Blake, as to whether this would be good information for somebody to supply you to talk about a sail plan going to Osaka. Uh, top right there uh, for for this um, uh, for this uh, race, you're likely to be on your heavy jib for nearly a quarter of the time. You're likely to be on your reaching zero for nearly a quarter of the time. So these sorts of things can help you. Oh, I have lost control. Uh, yeah, it's, um, it's disappeared for some reason. Keep talking and I'll see what I can do to bring it back. Someone's Can everyone see the screen? <laughs> No, it stopped sharing. Um, I'm not sure why. Leave, leave with me. I'll bring it back. Um, so just coming um, well, until Martin brings it back, there's a question there is um, 
uh, about the East Australian current, when to push off, uh, and that's uh, that's a good question. That and you'd probably know that before you left um, for the start. Um, and what might determine that is where the eddies are. Um, so um, the East Australian current is not just a, a, a north south current. It's around between uh, Sydney or between um, uh, uh, Gabo Island, Island and. Oh, we've, oh, sorry, I've just let Rob Gunter in. He must have his... Just be Between Gabo Island, well, up the east coast of Australia, you, you, you might uh, you might hug it for 100 miles. You might go straight out. Um, but that's going to depend on, um, on, on on where the main eddies are. And there's generally a really, really big eddy off Gabo Island um, as to where you're going to cross it. Um, and... It is quite possible to cross the current with current. Um, so if you connect up to some of those eddies, you can possibly take a, a 45 degree dig out um, in favourable current as well. And uh, it's something that you really, really, uh, it, to me, it's the most important part of the weather conditions as to which way you're going to go with current as well. And not only the East Australian current, but also the equatorial currents and, uh, and the Curacao. So the Curacao guards uh, the entrance to Osaka Bay, and it, and he's generally sort of two or three days. If you line that up in the wrong way, it's it's not going to be fun for you. So just getting back to this heat map, map now. Um, so you got control back? Just I, I do. Oh, Thanks. do I have control? I do just now. Take control. Yeah, I'm not sure what happened yeah. then, but no. Oh. Um, so it is a reaching running race. 50% of the time, you could probably extend that out to 60 or more percent of the time uh, that it is reaching and running, um, with a, a but with a reasonable uh, amount of close hold as well. Um, and you can get some hectic winds in there as well. But this should give you uh, a, a fair indication of what you're likely to expect um, during your race. But uh, this is for a 40 odd foot boat um, and it, you know, it might not be the same for, you know, the Big Alive or the little S&S 34. So do these sort of uh, preparations yourself because they're really important. Not only are they important for your sail selection, but also how much food and water you might be wanting to take, um, if that makes sense. Um, so. I did talk about not routing in the doldrums a couple of sessions ago because the winds are so light that um, the routing just it's it's unforgiving and you know if it look if it finds wind fifty miles away it's going to want to take you there. Um, so I wanted to uh, I, and I don't know how much anybody knows about these things, but there's um, uh, a thing called the ASCATS, which is uh, which is near live wind. It's not wind prediction. Um, it's it's uh, it's done by a thing called a scatterometer from a, a satellite, and they measure the height of the waves and um, and the direction of the waves, and from that they about calculate the wind. Um, and to be able to find it, and I did this one a few days ago, and there's a monster hole there in the Solomon Sea that you can you can you can see from from the ASCATs, and that's the image on the left hand side, and and you notice that there's no wind barbs on land, that's because there's no waves on land, so it's not calculating that. But then when I overlaid the image, particularly with the rain radar, uh, you can see they line up pretty good, um, and if you want to get through these transition zones as best as you can, I'm recommending that you become an expert on satellite imagery and track these things. And because, you, you know, hopefully you're all using uh, good chart plotters now, you can track these things and predict, uh, you know, where the wind's going to either be or not be. Um, so hopefully, um, we've given you a bit of an idea on, 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 on what to expect along the course um, and also what to expect from a general point of view from uh, the wind 
and uh, conditions that you're likely to get. And as I said, there's no current there. And for mine, those that that um, master the current, they're the ones that are going to be standing on the podium. I think that's it from me, Martin. Thanks, Rod. That was absolutely brilliant. And you're right about the currents. The currents will, will make or break your race. It's quite incredible just reflecting how much technology is coming into this race and, and how understanding technology and using technology is, is becoming a deal breaker. Have we got any questions just coming through the chat? Otherwise, we will move on. Look, Rod, thank you. And I have a million questions, but we, we do have a bit to get through. So thanks for your time. Um, cheers, Martin. Um, I'm just going to take back control so we can move back. Um, what I need to do, well, what I'd like to do now is introduce Paul Roberts, um, the OSCB sail captain. And Paul, you there? Yeah. Thanks, uh, Martin. I'm just taking control. Uh, yep. Welcome everyone. Uh, so I'm going to give you a an update on NOR notice of race update and some compliance reminders. We're um, just got some um, changes which are going to go over, and, and this NOR is going to be um, re well the revision to the NOR is going to be issued in the, in the week or so. Okay, so the main changes uh, to the NOR, so there's been a just a re um, clarification on the trophies and um, mementos, um, which weren't quite right in the current NOR. The second um, change is a qualifying passage. We've got some new requirements, and that was all driven by a recent um, incident report, uh, which is the next bar incident report that um, basically was a two-handed sailors that went out on a qualifying passage and they were very lucky to survive. They lost their keel and it was on one of these uh, new far, um, far uh, 30-odd foot boat, about a 33-foot boat that lost its keel. And, and out of that, lessons learnt. There was a working committee. Um, there was a number of uh, recommendations and we've applied those to the notice of race, which I'll go over shortly. The next one is the navigation um, changes, to charts, changes to charts and associated documents, which uh, Rod has, has done a lot of work on this, um, and he did mention that in his presentation, and I'll go over some of those changes. Okay, so, so basically, uh, there's a bit of writing here. This is pretty much copied out of the, the current um, uh, revised NOR. So basically, the, I'll just go over this quickly. The, for the perpetual trophies, there's a line on us, which is the lowest elapsed time. It's not necessarily the first boat across the line. There's a friendship bowl, which is first place on ORCI, not, uh, not ORC club. So this is an ORCI, which is an international um, ORC rating. People need to be aware that if you want to... Um, participate in this this handicap system, you'll need an ORCI certificate, which is different from the club certificate. And just, uh, Paul, that'd be the all-purpose, I'm guessing, the all-purpose ORCI number? Yes, correct. Correct, Martin. All-purpose, correct. Um, so so people need to be aware, they got no RC club. To get an ORCI, you will need to apply for that, which is an extra cost to get that full ORCI. And that normally requires, if you want an accurate number on that certificate, you'll need an inclination test, which you probably need for your stability anyway, unless you're, and that was covered in the previous um, the previous session we had. Uh, we've got the Kate Mitchell uh, Perpetual Trophy that's first on AMS, and then we've got the, um, the Performance Handicap Trophy. Um, the first, the Osaka Cup Trophy, the first um, Sandringham boat, Across the line, which is a um, which is a big um, shell, um, which is available. If anyone's in the Casino Ham Yacht Club, you'll see that in the trophy cabinet. <clears throat> okay, so the overall winner is is basically the is based on AMS or RCI, and that's the <clears throat> and it'll be the overall winner based on the the most number of entrants in that handicap division between AMS and RCI. <clears throat> 
And then we've got the mementos, which will be um, takeaway um, mementos. And then we have trophy presentation in Osaka, and the details of that will be announced, um, be advised, and probably through a notice of race. Okay, moving on for the qualifying passage. We, um, yes, yeah, again, this, this, this was uh, <clears throat> driven from the lessons learnt from the next bar incident. <clears throat> so uh, basically, if you if you don't, um, and you will need to do a qualifying passage only if you are not uh, going to use any of the uh, accepted qualifying races, either the West Coast or Sydney Hobart. And so you will need to do a you will need to uh, apply for approval for dispensation to carry out this qualifying passage, and it's got to be done no more than six months before the race of the start. Race start. <clears throat> so basically, if you and there's there's a whole host of requirements here, and this is all based on safety. So the main thing here is we we want people when they do the qualifying passage to be safe. And I've basically outlined that um, you'll need a communication schedule. You'll need all the safety equipment that you pretty much you'll be taking for the Asaka uh, to be on as part of the notice of race will be on that qualifying passage. And, and obviously that excludes fuel and water requirements because it's going to be, you know, you're not, you're not going to be doing a 6,000 nautical mile uh, qualifying passage. And we want sure contacts to be arranged and we want you to, you know, carry out a detailed log um, and, and, and preferably be in contact with the marine rescue, whether, whether you're in Victoria or New South Wales. Uh, and then we want a snapshot of your chart plotter before and after and the distance on your GPS. So all that paperwork will be put together and uh, sent in as part of your qualifying passage. Okay, moving forward. So Rod um, mentioned the, um, we talked about the chart plotting. So we've got new requirements, we've well, clarified the requirements around the ENC. And Rod has um, done some great work on sourcing some um, great deals as mentioned from uh, boat books. So, so basically, we, if we go through the chart plotting device, we've made a little change here. It can be either your, a dedicated chart plotter or a notebook computer, i.e. with Expedition, with uh, chart plotting type software running the ENC type charts. Or the other option is you can use paper charts, but they need to be up to date. And you need to have proof that your charts that you've got, say they might be five or 10 years old, you'll need to go through all the notice of the mariners and make sure that those paper charts are up to date. Okay, so we've also revamped and had a look at all the hard copy and soft copies of the of the um, a lot of the mariners books and um, and the light lists, etc. And these um, these publications we've found and again Rod's done some great work on that have found uh, pretty much free software downloads on PDFs. So we're changing the NOR to allow you to take the PDFs instead of the big hard copies. In the previous Asakas, it'd be, there would be kilos and kilos of these books, hard copy books, and they're quite expensive. So what we've done is we've revamped that and to allow PDFs. And we've also put a requirement there to have two independent electronic devices to store these publications and these PDFs, i.e. say a notebook and an iPad. So uh, if one of these devices fails, at least you've got uh, backup. And the same thing, we've looked at the tide table books. We've, we've made these redundant and said, no, we don't, you don't need the hard copies because basically you'll be, uh, a lot of this information is going to be readily available on the internet. Okay, so moving forward. Um, so Looking at charts and publication and sources, again, I mentioned Rod's done a lot of work on this and he's, and he's kindly um, found some sources and we we're currently, um, for the ENC charts, we, we're looking at a, a single click purchase, which is around the 550 to $600 for a six month subscription from Boat Books and we'll provide probably will we'll provide as part of the notice competitors a more details to come on that. But that's a very good deal considering, you know, 
um, for six months to have access to all the updated ENC charts is, is a fantastic deal. And a lot of the other publications are uh, free download from the Australian Hydrographic Office Department. And these, um, we will provide a list of those in these NOR. And there's other publications exactly as Rod said from the NOAA site. Um, we found we can we can get those downloaded and that's gonna save uh, around a thousand dollars compared to the other races in the past. Okay, so going on to compliance reminders, I just wanna remind everyone um, about compliance as far as an admin your whole construction we need yeah we need that in early i've had a lot of a bit of correspondence with people coming in and asking about the whole construction um, requirements which is great so please if you've got any if you've got any questions please submit them on on email to us and we'll come back to you and, and clarify if you've got any queries the same with stability Please, if you need to organise inclination tests, do it early. Don't leave it at the last minute. Same with the crew, your safety sea survival course. Please look at booking it in. The RCV, you've got, if you go onto the website, have got a lot of um, courses and uh, coming up before the race. So please get in early and start booking your courses. First aid and rotor operator qualifications, again, if you haven't got them, um, please organise as soon as you can. Uh, and mentioned there is your, your um, OSCI and your AMS. If you're interstate, um, particularly for AMS, because it's a base, that AMS rule is based out of uh, Melbourne, contact us um, for the measurers to get them organised so you can get a certificate put together. Generally, AMS can be turned around very quickly if, if you got if, based on the measurements. Okay, same with Cat, Cat 1 safety audits. Um, we, we will need dedicated RCV auditors because we've got additional uh, NOR requirements with the bulkheads and the stern requirements for the bulkheads. Uh, and, and just a note there, all uh, compliance documentation it needs to be uploaded via the top yacht entry system. And there's a, an issue there, just, just if, if, if anything's too large, then you're going to have to try and reduce the size because the top yacht entry system has a size limit which is around um, 500. I think it's about uh, size-wise, it needs to be less than one megabyte. Okay, is there any uh, questions? We do have one from Kevin, Paul, but if I can just jump yeah. in um, on a question. the You talked about the qualify, you can do your um, passage or whatever in you know in osaka conditions um i'm guessing then that you would need your triple sc and all that sort of thing and all those qu crew qualifications to be able to do that qualifier ah uh, correct yep is that a, well that that would be per the NOR requirements yep which is good. specified in there correct good good uh, question Excellent. And we had a question from Kevin, which Rod's gone into on the text, but I'll just quickly. Kevin asked if the ENC purchase is registered on one <clears> PC or plotter or two, and Rod's come back, short answer, yes, it can be on multiple machines. So that redundancy can be included for the uh, there's a um, There's a permit number required for ENCs, which gets provided to you by your um, you know, your expedition or whoever, or where, wherever you're going to use your ENCs. Um, so in the case of expedition, if you've got that on two machines, it'll be the same permit number. And yes, you can have your ENCs across uh, across two or, or three or however many licenses you've got to display it. Good questions. Any other questions for Paul uh, on any of the sort of race management stuff before we move on? Okay. What we have next is um Blake. We've got a guest, Blake. Now, we haven't tested Blake's audio, so I'm just going to ask while I do the preamble. Blake, just give us a hello just to make sure yep. you can. How are you going? Excellent. And you see a little button for take control? Yep. I'm trying not to press it again. No, no, do it. Uh, <laughs> press it now. Press it now. Oh, thanks, Blake. I'll return I, the I favor. honestly think I did that while Rob was talking, and it just completely obliterated the whole thing. Oh, was, um, it, was it? Oh, yeah, nice. it was. Yeah. At least oh, I admitted well it. <laughs> All right. Well, look, I'm um, just introducing Blake. Blake is um, manager of Doyle Sales in Melbourne, and uh, a lot of people know Blake Anderson and his father, Cole. Um, but Blake, welcome along, and thanks for spending time tonight. 
Thank you. Well, it's been good to actually listen in on a few things. And Rod's um, Rod's little bit was actually really helpful and and quite important. That I didn't get to actually say what I was going to say when he put up that little sale chart and what was used and the percentages. And I think um, that stuff's so critical. I was talking to Martin about it. It's really important that we actually get that kind of data, even from the previous experiences. So that was really cool. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to get on to the next one. Um, you should see little arrows down the bottom there yeah, under the slide. I'm, that's actually not working for me, Martin. Isn't it? All right. Well, I'm going to take it back. Can you just you can say click next, it. Yeah. next? You say next slide when you're ready. Yeah. Um, so I've kind of just taken a bit from what we did last time around, but we've got a little less time. So I thought we'd just touch on a few things. Um, not so much getting to the detail of the sales and what we're going to do, but just really the key points and the critical things that we need to watch, make sure we have on the boat um, to set ourselves up um, for a few reasons. And the, and the key ones being obviously getting there. Um, you know, we don't want to have a situation where we're not, you know, setting our boat up with the right sails that are in good condition to ensure that we can, can end the race with the sails at the same performance that we want to at the start. Um, you know, it's really critical that we don't have, you know, old sails that are you know, beaten up after seven years and, and we just kind of give those ones a bit of a crack and a few little things like that. We just want to set the boat up as best we can um, to have reliable, durable sails on the boat. Um, and I, I mean, it's great for me to say, but uh, it, it's important that you set yourself up for the Osaka. Um, it's it's always been a case for me, for most people that come to me really ask, you know, what what do I need to add to my inventory? But my first go-to is actually what do we have to make sure that the current inventory is right um, and add from there? Um, because most boats will be set up almost correctly to what they need to do and they've been, you've been all been sailing for plenty of time to ensure that you do have what you need for shorthanded sailing, as most of you will be doing frequently. Um, so it's really just for now, planning those finer details and making sure what you already have is good and then adding on from there. Um, obviously the critical thing that you've you've all, if you haven't really been experiencing much two handed and you're starting to get into it, um, or as you already have, having sales that are easy to handle um, is not only meaning lighter, easier sales, it's more so easy to handle with reducing the need to change sales, um, having sales that can be in a fixed position for a long time so you don't actually have to take them down and put them away, um, and minimising sale changes um, by reducing the inventory um, and setting your boat up accordingly for the race around that. Um, obviously, that comes in line with an easy to trim sale. And by that, I, I really try to I, I work around the fact that you, you try and have as many all-purpose sales um, that can kind of get you into bridging the gaps between where other boats might have two or three sails. You might only have one. Um, so we need to you need to make sure that that sail you've got, if it was a J1 that's covering a J2 range as well, that it's just got an easy to trim aspect that's going to allow you to A, set it up for light air and B, set it up for heavy air um, and, and not be a sail that you have to really work really hard to do so. Um, so moving on to the next one. Um, obviously, we've got the key key requirements of any boat is, is to have upwind sails, downwind sails, reaching sails and storm sails. Um, but we'll, I really just wanted to go into the, a little bit into the detail of the criticals. Um, as far as upwind's concerned, as I just touched on, it's it's how many sails you really want to have on the boat to allow yourself to to have the best performance across the range and ensure that you're not having to obviously change sails too frequently but also have those modes um and and that really does refer back to that kind of data that um rod showed us earlier um this race does have obviously a large range of of um wind strengths and wind angles that you're going to have to sail through um but when you're upwind it's going to have a, a reasonable average that's going to show to you what kind of sails you really need and that's that that's what you really need to knuckle down on your boat and ensure that you've got that that perfect suit of sails as minimal as possible um to to hit those ranges and and reduce the need to kind of change sails um frequently um and and i think you can see from the averages that rod showed up that it, it's actually not 
ridiculous to to think that you can have a sale go from eight to eighteen knots, and that was almost, I think, as it as it showed, like eighteen twenty percent of the the overall race. So, um, and from there it was downwind. So it's important that you kind of look around that and 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 minimise the number of sales required based on the range that you really need them for. Um, <clears throat> obviously, there's a big thing for performance versus rating. Um, as we've got AMS and ORC, it is it is a little bit hard. The two rating systems do work against each other from from for the next slide in the in the downrange, but it's um it's more so f- um the rating side of things I'm I'm talking about for upwind would would really be around. It, do I have a, a big heavy boat that I just want to get there quick? Um, you don't want to be out there forever, um, and some people just might want to weigh up whether or not they want to try and have a boat that might necessarily not really rate that well ever um, and, and go down that path um, and, and come out with an outcome of a slow boat that's not really going to rate that well anyway um, and enjoy the race and get there fast instead. Um, and I think that's really important. Uh, there is always a balance and you just got to work with not only your sail maker or, um, but also within your own meet, uh, mentors as to to what sort of boat you have and and what they what what you and your mentors and everyone around you will will say is is will help you with what's best um obviously with with upwind sales it's important <clears throat> around the attachment methods methods and the sail handling um you all have very different boats and 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 you're probably working through now as the, as it gets down to the nitty gritty what really does work for you as far as whether it's a furling sail or a hanked on sail i think all of you would know that a foil or a luff tape sail is probably the hardest thing on the planet if you if you're short-handed so it's probably not the last thing you want to have on a boat um so those of you with furlers are probably having to think about how many how many furling sails you can have up at once and not necessarily use that one foil that you've got and little things like that and and it's really important that you do as much training as you can to really put yourself in conditions that that show you how hard it can be if you really need to change sails to to really work around what you want to do moving forward uh, on to the next one there, Martin. Uh, I just I thought I'd put a few pictures through while I was talking, but because I can't click, it's probably a bit harder. But this just gives you a few references of the different types of sails that we've we've set up over um, different types of cruising boats, racing boats, um, into the sail handling as far as um, what sort of systems. I might just hold there. <clears throat> so most of your boats will be already set up with what you need, um, but it's important that, for for shorthanded sailing, it's, it's super critical that we just have some means to actually attach the mainsail and keep it in the track. Um, there will be a lot of times of reefing and and dropping sails and pulling them up, and you don't want it to be too hard for you. So, I mean, most of you probably already have some form of RCB system. Um, if you're running a bolt rope, you may want to consider some of the thing the the items on the left, just as far as um, a simple system that might replace your rcb type system um more for smaller boats sub 40 feet anything over that 40 45 feet you really want to start looking at an rcb system like on the right from ronstan or 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 other brands um it really just makes life a lot easier um and obviously there are those other options of fill booms and whatnot but um i really just I think for what we're the types of boats that are doing this race, they've either already got them or um, looking into that RCB system. Um, and I thought I'd just pop that in there. I mean, you can everyone's probably thought about them. Every, the 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 best race boats in the world, all of the Amokas, all of the Open Forties, Class Forties, um, they're all running Lazy Jacks, and and if you don't have them um you, yeah you, you need them they're the simplest thing to put on the boat and, and you can make them lightweight and easy um downwind's not really much different you've got to look at, at what sort of sails we do need um again look at that data and make sure that you're setting up for the range that you expect to see um this downwind and reaching is probably the most important one on on that performance versus rating um there is a big range to how big a spinnaker you want to put on your boat and and feel that you can carry um and also into that range of of the types of code zeros and whatnot that you're looking at um there's plenty of different setups that 
that that you can choose from and and all sale makers or, or most sale makers are getting their heads wrapped around the the three sale setups and furling sale setups and different assays um and symmetricals um if you go through to the next one martin I, it, <laughs> we'll be able to show a few of the different options um this this boat here has actually got a furling a3 um, it works as a top-down system, like most of you have probably learned. We've got a real um, theory on that for me is um, if you've got a reaching sail or an eighth, or an odd sail being an A1 or an A3 or um, something of that nature in a furling asymmetrical is is better to have it as a furling sail and it, and it will be very easy to do or a lot easier to do. Um, whereas my my attitude towards running sales and some of you might have tried is to probably go down the path of having a spinnaker sock or a snuffer um, to actually stow that sail instead from a handling point of view um, and that that is a really good go-to obviously all your um, code zeros and reaching sales um, the great thing about technology now is that we can pretty much put anything on a furler it's just what we how we attach that sail or that that stay to the boat that really does it. And this picture really shows you um, someone that's obviously sailing around the world with by themselves. Um, they have an inner staysail that's got a, its own cable, an independent cable that's fixed to a lock at the top and a, and a purchase system at the bottom to enable them to get maximum stay tension on that inner staysail that's actually out. The next one outside of that and, and the one again, they're both on locks again, but they've all got the, the one that's actually um, the second one from the mast has actually got a similar setup to the staysail, um, whereas the one on the outer will will likely be um, set up with as as a, as a four stay or a head stay. So um, it's really important just to kind of think about your boat and 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 different ways you can set it up. And it's probably really critical for a couple of the people that I've spoken to around. How do I how do I set around that that J two type sail? But then I want to go to a stay sail, but my my inner stay set up around my spreaders and the problem solving there. I mean, you can see from this boat, we've they're they're managing to have that extra head sail inside that stay again um, to allow them to have what it, what would be considered a number three on a boat like uh, the boats we've, we we see in the Osaka. So it's there's different ways to set your boat up and and have an open mind. Um, and you can certainly set your boat up around what what sail area it needs in those three conditions that really got shown in that data that um, Rod showed us. Um, just a couple of more um, details on on different staysail setups and arrangements that you can really have. Um, code zeros are probably the critical one from the data you can see, and also A twos um, slash um, symmetricals. The data and what Rod showed is really around that. 25 percent um with the with the code zero and 20 percent with the a2 now probably if rod smacked a s2 in there it'll probably show at the s2 more than the a2 so those with symmetrical boats don't dismiss the idea of a symmetrical i know that a lot of boats took them for the last few years and that and they do use them quite a lot so pick pick your battle as far as handleability is concerned and minimizing sales but um don't dismiss the fact that some of you do have heavy displacement boats and they do like to just go dead downwind um a couple of images of, of those sailing ha sail handling systems that i was talking about you've all seen them um and again just working around the the types of sails that you're trying to use whether or not socks are better than than furling systems um and and talk to your sail maker or your rigger about what sort of stuff that you they think you can get away with and and their experiences um i know a lot of people go down the path of trying to have deep running sails on furlers and whatnot but we um we generally found right before the osaka that we ended up buying i think i sold five spinnaker socks to different customers including grant um where grant to noon that was um that just found that it was just way too hard to fill the um asymmetricals and was just a simpler and easier way just to snuffer it down for the for that race in particular um i don't know how much more there is yeah no, there you go. i mean people are going to have questions i'm pretty confident we're going to get a lot of questions i suppose yeah. an observation the last I, I raced a couple of weeks ago two-handed on a boat and we really struggled because of how narrow the trimming range was of the kite we were using you know, if mm. we heated up it collapsed if we went too deep it collapsed and was just what's your thoughts on uh, on a forgiving sale rather than an out and out performance 
that really yeah that comes down to that um you you do sacrifice a little bit on on maybe a really deep running sail um just to ensure that you have that ease of trim um you know there's going to be a lot of time where you're on autopilot um you're not going to be driving the whole time the boat you know is isn't as responsive with some of your boats or most of your boats unless you've got some seriously good tech uh, and um, you're by so, yourself, so you know yeah. there's, there's a limit to what you can do. There's only so much you can do, and you're not going to sit there trimming, and you're not going to um, put the bow down every two seconds. So yeah, a hundred percent, and that's and that's what it's really around. Um, you know, even I think that's what, I think the symmetricals in some way are almost forgiving in the in the fact that you can really just strap back and and set to that deep angle in that in that mid range. Um, but yeah. yeah, you definitely need to be looking at sales that are a lot more all-purpose than you know you would normally do for optimum race performance. Yeah, a couple of questions. We've got a fairly technical question from Paul, which is give examples of the difference between the two rating systems, OSCI and AMS, in terms of sale restrictions, which are going to really affect your rating. That's a big question. Yeah. Um, but I'm glad I'm not answering it. Over to you. It's not too bad. Um, look, I think... From what I'm, from what I know, um, I mean, the big thing about AMS is, is, is and and it's a great system, and and especially for club races in the bay. I think the big thing that we need to remember is that it is still a windward lured system. Um, so what what we're finding is that obviously the basics of what you would set your boat up for, and 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 what was okay probably five six years ago as far as the types of sails that we sail with. Uh, it's probably evolved and AMS probably doesn't have the systems to really penalise or or change their rating accordingly. So where we're kind of sitting at the moment is AMS have a basic rule of thumb that spinnakers are spinnakers as long as their um, mid-girth percentage is 75% or more of the foot. Your headsails are anything under under that <laughs> and and mainsails are obviously just mainsails. So that so as far as AMS is concerned, we're we're able to kind of sail with code zeros and um, assies and symmetricals, and it's all kind of based around that that square meterage and and the and the um, pole or or sprit that it's attached to. So they're the real key components to how that rating system changes. Where the complexity comes in is probably around the ORCI um set up and and how they're rating sales now where where they've brought in a lot more they have a lot more rules and 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 um key rating changes around the types of sales that you want to use um whether they be from from the reaching point of view that we're looking at code zeros whether they're flying headsails or code zeros um whether they're 60 percent mid girth zeros or um 75 percent mid girth zeros so ORC is definitely something um, that you can be creative with because of the way the rating is, um, but you also, you know, will be penalised if you if you do do it kind of wrong. Um, you'll be penalised for for really perfect sail choices as well, but the outcome will be the reward of of a faster performing boat that a rating system can't keep up with. So I think the Osaka is probably perfect, the perfect race for for the way the ORC is actually set up. So don't be scared to to push the boundaries a bit on on certificates, those with the luxury to, that can afford um, to, to put a few more reaching sales in their inventory. ORC, I will probably um, allow you to research a bit more in, in some different types of code zeros maybe. Um, or, or, or types of asymmetricals that you sail with that lean very towards that all-purpose attitude of being able to probably pay a penalty but have a sail that might give you a bit more than you might have in the past with something like an just, AMS certificate. Just to back you up on um, taking risks, if people saw photos of Chinese Whisper in the last race, their head, their head still was a Genoa, I think it was. Um, yeah. It cost them one day on handicap, but they, they decided it was worth it and, and it paid off for them. Hundred um, percent, um, and it was a really a... easy sale to leave up too. Yeah, I've got a question, a lot of questions. Um, one from Richard Grant, which was the one I thought we'd always get, which is the: Do you recommend a light weight weight main for going through the doldrums? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I knew I would leave something off. I left it off last time, which meant I left it off this time. <laughs> um, All right. Yeah. So um, around light wind, light wind sales. I think most boats will have drifters in their inventory or something of that nature. So we're a lot of boats around are, are carrying um, 
most of us are carrying spinnaker staysails that we um, we can adjust and make set quite well in, in light air. So that's probably a good tip to maybe reducing the amount of sails in the inventory. Um, but as far as that lightweight mainsail is concerned, it really just protects the good main as well. Um, it's 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 nice to have up in the light, but it's also protecting that that primary sail from flogging and shaking and and fatigue that's really unnecessary in 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 the times where there really is that light stuff. So yeah, that's flop, um, that flop yeah. flop stuff. Exactly. Okay, right. um, I'm going to skip over Rods because he's just trying to sell one. Um, <laughs> Grant, you feel, Blakey, your thought on an A1.5 versus an A2? Um, yeah, so as far as coding is concerned, um, for those that don't know, or, or it's probably more in detail, as I said before, is, is A1s, A3s, A5s, those odd numbers are around a reaching type sail, um, and A2s, A4s, A6s are around an a, a running type sail. So, you know, when you say A1.5, it really hits that, that range between what is a light air beam, a light air reaching sail, and a and a and a medium air running sail. So, looking at the data, and especially off what Rod said and, and a few others, I mean, it's A one five A two. It's probably um, a term rather than what you would do. But yes, it's an A one five is something. It's a lightweight um, AP runner, um, which kind of hits that target that we were talking about. I think where you would be careful is just making sure you don't have too many spinnakers in the inventory, and especially given that the A2 range um, or or a medium heavy running range is where you're really um, trying to set up for. Um, so that's where I would say um, a, a heavier kite that gets you a bit further into the range would be better. Um, if you have and the an observation, range, like it, it's the sort of race you could easily damage a kite. So there's yeah, the, so you're probably yeah. going to have multiple mastheads anyway. Mm -hmm. um, but leading towards probably more where um, the A15 comes into gear is, is that you do kind of have that that medium light runner that would, if you did break the A2, yep. would would give you that option and, right, and you, more, it would save you. Yep. Two more questions um, and then we probably need to move on. Um would you recommend a three leaf main or one that has two deeper reef points? Um, uh, look, I'm, I'm more a fan of three reefs these days on the basis of um, for shorthanded boats set up with RCB systems that we need a trisal. Um, and you can't use a trisal with a lot of the track systems. So I end up doing that third reef as that 50% reef. I don't normally suggest it to performance or, or that kind of full crude race boats if I can if I can avoid it um, but in this situation I think it's probably a better option to have three reefs and have that third reef of so 50% just from the handleability side of things more than anything um, shorthanded get in storm conditions I think that's where you really want your your, yeah. your trust with, to a, be with a caveat is the risk factor has just gone up with a big heavy boom um, particularly if you're yeah. running deep yeah um it is just really a sacrifice based around the track systems and what you do have um i would as a side note always say have a trisel on your boat no they're very what. very good and particularly yeah. short if if you can put them up easily as you said um yeah. paul made a mention that the nasa race has got an allowance for lightweight mains and jibs i think he meant so um refer to the nasa race there uh, Grant just observed he'd have an A4 for sure, which, yeah, I yeah. guess you would. Um, Blake, awesome. Thank you. And we're going to Thank hear you. from you again in, I don't know, a few months' time when you talk about sail repair, I believe. Yeah. But appreciate your time. Thanks very much on behalf of everyone. And thanks, thanks for giving for up your me. evening. All good. All right. Um, and that was Blake.Anderson at doylesales.com.au, I think, it, if I get that right. Just okay, <laughs> now I'm going to hand over to Paul. Paul, if you could take control and um, give us a hello and continue on with luxuries. Yeah, sure. Thanks, um, Martin, and thank you, uh, Blake, for uh, providing that um, great presentation on sale preparation. Look, I'm, this one is not going to be a long um, presentation, but I thought I'd just um, talk about some specific luxuries to maximise your enjoyment. And it's mainly picture based. I just want to give uh, you participants an idea of 
it's not um, it's it's all about maximising your enjoyment and making little small luxuries um, a bit of pleasure. So, look, this this photo was taken from the 2013 race that Martin and myself went in, and I think Martin brought the umbrella. And I've got one. I still have it. If someone wants still to the piece, so, and, and... <laughs> <laughs> so, so look, a lot of the you talked about Rod again, talking about the doldrums, and and a lot of I think here was only about five, four or five knots of true wind speed, and the sun during the tropics is 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 in very intense. You just cannot. It's very hard to stay out in the sun um, all your for your watch of three or four hours in the middle of the day. It's absolutely stifling hot, and you can see there things like bean bags. You know, you need definitely need a bean bag each so you can both sit in the cockpit out of the sun uh, during the tropics, and and it's you know all about enjoyment. Here's another. Here's a photo of Martin. In fact, um, we're talking about you. you you're celebrating milestones with uh, sham bottles of champagne or sparkly. It um, doesn't have to be alcoholic, but, um, yeah, you need to uh, at least take a couple of bottles maybe for when you enter Osaka Bay and one for when you um, you cross the equator, as we've seen from there. I think we just copied the Vendée Globe boats there where they uh, get out the writing of, and take the photo. Uh, sun and rain protection. Now, this happened to be uh, the only photo I could find, but I think Martin went down and just bought some uh, cloth uh, from Bunnings. And during, you know, during the when it's, the sun's out, we use the for rain protection as well. But predominantly, you need to rig up. If you have not got a bimini or some sort of protection on your race boat, you, you definitely need a sunshade because you'll find during the uh, tropics, Again, you, this that it's be so hot. In fact, the boat heats up so much that the off-watch uh, crew member you'll find will even sleep in the cockpit uh, under the shade because it's going to be so hot down below that you sometimes you cannot possibly sleep down below. So you need to um, sleep in the cockpit under the shade. So you need some sort of shade protection you can rig up from your boom or your bimini. Um, wherever you feel comfortable, because you end up bringing up your cushions and sleeping in the cockpit some of the time. Just moving forward, you have some of the uh, options there are fishing. Um, admittedly, the one on the right there was coming back from Osaka. Where we caught so much fish that we didn't, uh, we just stopped fishing. Um, in fact, we uh, one of the biggest fish I'd ever caught in my life was a mass, um, was, a, was some massive fish. Uh, coming into the boat. Look, uh, one of the things we had, and I can still remember Martin in the morning at uh, four or five in the morning uh, making some espresso coffee on a, on a simple coffee maker. And that was, um, if you like coffee, being from, if you're from Melbourne, then uh, definitely recommend buying a nice little coffee maker. Uh, another luxury is obviously if you, if you uh, want some alcohol, there's nothing like a cold, um, cold VB. Um, and red wine wise, I think we had on the definitely bought lots of red wine. It was really nice as the sun going down, and we would always make a, a point of having a uh, drink of wine as a handover around the five o'clock mark when the sun went down and over a meal. It was absolutely fantastic. You don't want you want to take lots of treats uh, again if you like chocolate, your cashews, and uh, yeah, you need to look after your. Um, have some nice luxury foods. Okay, cooking. Cooking your um, one of the things we did was we bought one of these butane um, little gas uh, cooktops, and we found that um, we would set that up in the cockpit. Again, it was too hot down below to even cook, so we did a lot of cooking in the cockpit through the tropics, and we just got those little butane canisters on a uh, you know it was about a thirty dollar stove. And we, um, yeah, we cooked up all our steaks that we had cryovac in the fridge and the freezer, uh, bacon and eggs for breakfast. So great um, device to cook outside in the cockpit. Okay, looking at hygiene and um, yeah, one of these camp shower units. They're uh, you know you buy this from the camping shop. You put you fill it up with water, hang it outside in the in the sun, and you'll have a nice hot shower off the and just rig it up off the mast. You have some great showers. I can't recommend 
And the other thing is don't just buy one, buy about uh, half a dozen of them or buy a good quality one because you find that they don't last very long and they can split. Well, they fall off the side of the uh, boat, which I've had happen before as well. Uh, the other thing there, you just want to look at, there's a lot of times we're going to be off watch, uh, sorry, on watch by yourself. And um, you need to think about um, some some maybe music or pod, uh, podcasts. Go and copy some podcasts off the internet, wherever, and um, play them on your on your device with the phone, for, for on your phone or iPad, and 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 start li listening to some to some uh, podcasts. Whatever your subject is, you will have plenty of time for it. And likewise, uh, one of the things that Martin did on when we did the trip is he had did a lot of the um, uh, the sound books and uh, and listen and you can listen to lots of books because you obviously can't read because you'd be busy trying to sail your boat. But highly recommended to get some audio books on your device. So that's about it. it just gives you a bit of a flavour. I've probably missed out. There's probably one thing I can miss out. You'll need plenty of fans down there on again because it gets hot down below so any any questions or suggestions probably just an observation paul because we did the race together it sounds a bit mm. flippant all the stuff but if we're happy and getting along and chatting and and enjoying ourselves then when we're actually racing we were trying a lot harder than we would have if we were grumpy or bored or hungry or you know uncomfortable or you just perform better yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. A happy boat, a fast boat. Yeah, and if we didn't have the coffee, there's no way we would have done that as well as we did. No, that's right. <laughs> uh, any questions from the floor before we move on? That's got a great advice. Thanks, Cyrus. But, yeah, just think about holistic. you you got to be in the zone. you got to be happy. you got to be switched on. And you've got to be getting along as a, as, a, as a pair. Like getting along was such an important thing for us. Um, I'm just going to take back control, Paul. Thanks, Paul, sure. and appreciate your time. Um, our next speaker, and I think it's our final speaker, is going to be Simon Dryden. Um, Simon's done the race several times, so he knows exactly about this stuff, which is about rigging and safety stuff. Simon, you give us a hello. Yeah, good day, Martin. All right, all yours. Yeah, welcome everybody. Um, yeah, just if to reiterate what we've talked about tonight, I'd um, say I agree with that you need some treats and some way of keeping your spirits and um, ways of managing the stuff because there's weird things like when you sail in the sea for seven days and don't see no land, no competitors, it's kind of weird. So you need every bit of help that you can to um, make sure that you're in a happy place so that you can sail hard. All right, tonight we're just going to talk about some various things and we're just choosing a couple of things that here that are quite important. One of the things that you'll find in an Osaka race is whether you have wind or not, or no wind, you will mostly have swell all of the time. So having a method of um, fixing your boom in place by a prevent preventer is very important. So the, the classic stand of preventers, you can see that little chart I've showed you there. If you do your preventer that goes um, not to the bow of the boat, you can see in sort of 40 knots of wind, it's got 6,000 um, kilos of force. And if you have one to the front, it's only got 1,400. And so it really works really, really well to have that sort of preventer. And in the next slide, I'll show you how um, it was set up on um, um, Grant's boat, Blue Water Tracks. So you can see at this end here where the red arrow is, is where it was hooked to the back of the boom behind the main sheet. And then on his boat, he had two of them and they were put either side of the boom and they were fixed with Velcro. So when he used these um, preventers, as you can see in this picture here, that one side was taken off, it was attached between the spectra piece and the rope that went to the bow and then back down to the stern, Was it was attached with a bit of VB cord and there were three loops of VB cord. And so if the boom did jibe unexpectedly from a change of wind and heavy wind, like in a thunderstorm or something like that, um, you the thing would break and the boom would come across. So that's one of the methods. Um, lots of single-handed boats 
um, have used different methods, but it's very important that you think about when you're running deep that you have a method of safely securing your boom. And then also when you are going to windward or reaching, you might look at a way of having a rope that goes down to where your turning block for your spinnaker is, and then you move the um, your traveller across to the other side, so you end up with a triangular type shape, which is going to hold your boom in the, in in a in a specific space to stop your mainsail flogging back and forth. Because if you don't have your boom secured two handed, it can be very dangerous in moving around the deck and standing up. So I would encourage all of you to think about safety and two handed. The boom is one of your biggest dangers, and so to having a satisfactory system. And when you're thinking about making such a system is you need to be able to adjust it easily and quickly from the cockpit because you don't want to be going up to the bow in the middle of the night um, undoing the thing. You want to have a, a block up there. So do it like an old fashioned downhaul on a pole so that it's just to deplete at the back. You can adjust it whenever you need and it's quick and easy to use. Lots of people have suggested for this, for controlling the booms, the use of boom, break, boom breaks. I've had one. I don't particularly like the fact that where they're attached provides much more strain on your gooseneck and um, on the fitting that's close to the mark. So it can be a problem, but I have put up a link there and I'll ask Martin just to copy that link and put it in the chat so you can go and have a look at that review by World Sailing of Boom Breaks. Moving along, um, we're just going to look at, and this is a, probably a good time to start to think about, is this race is going to be eight Sydney Hobarts and 12 Melbourne Hobarts in a row. So if you think about the number of waves your boat's going to go over, the number of times your mast is going to pump, number of times your four stay is going to move sideways, the number of times your rope on the top roll of attaching your mainsail or your um, Hetzel is going to roll up and over the roller there. So it's just going to be moving all the time for 24 hours a day. So one of the things that we suggest you do is having a look at your boat is that you're able to put enough backstay to, to, to bend your mast and then you might need something to hold the mast like a check stay. And these days with Spectra, very easy to do. Rig um, as a, a check stay up and then you just have it through a friction block at the back and then onto the lazy jib winch. And they're easy to do when you're going on long journeys, when you're pounding into it, you can keep your rig stable just to reduce the amount of force that's on that. If we look at um, your rigging, I would encourage you that the best way of doing this is you can do a mast inspection in the boat, but I would recommend that all of you in this next little time have your rigging out and check what you need to what you need to do. Um, the thing is, have a look at your, you know, your instruments, your VHF aerial, all of those things that are very important. And thinking about going on such a race, your VHF aerial, it might have got some order in the cable. Doesn't cost a lot of money, so you can. Um, get that bit of cable replaced to make sure that you've got your VHF coverage so that you can talk to various people. I would recommend if you have your rigging that's maybe five years old, I would definitely replace the D2s and the four stay because they are both items that have repetitive loads as the boat pumps over each wave. Something not to be forgotten, goosenecks on boats, the booms are getting bigger and bigger these days and they need to be closely inspected, make sure that the pins mightn't be sleeved or whatever that needs to happen, but it's again a point of failure. Um, boom vam again, is most of us have now solid boom vangs, and so they have quite a lot of movement up and down. They're gonna work in quite hold, holding your boom up um, in lighter conditions and then being used to hold your boom down in heavier winds. The, Real hard bit in this race is to have a good look at all your equipment. So it's about looking at your pins, your shackles, your blocks, all of those things. And then it's again thinking about how in the race you set up a procedure that every week or every two days we do um, a check from the top to the bottom. We get the binoculars out, have a look at the rig. When it's nice, we go and have a quick check and see if all those things are happening. Um, 
when you in take your mast out, make sure that you look at your halyard sheaves because you don't want a halyard jumping off. Are they the biggest? Are they the best they can be? Because these things are going to work very hard. And so have a look at the halyard sheaves and make sure that they last. Um, so we've talked about the the rig the the rig check and things. The other thing that lots of boats might not have when you come from a racing field is that you might not have the su sufficient size shackles to adjust your rigging on the go. So whether something comes undone or you need to tighten something up, so make sure that you have the right sorts of shackles and things that you can do. And again, the most useful thing is think about all of the things that can go wrong with your mast and rigging. And it's about having the tools that you can fix things and you can replace things. So lots of spectra and various things, um, friction loops and things. And we've just got a picture there of an angle grinder with a, a, a box of those nice one, one millimeter cutting blades. You can do a lot of work and it can also be used as a safety item. If we look at halyards and sheets, um, I'd have to say to you that um, in our first Osaka race, we broke the jib halyard, and by the time we, there was nothing you could do once the halyard broke and the whole sail fell into the sea, and pulling the sail in by yourself was quite an effort on Yoko, so it was a big, 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 big jib. And so I would recommend that if you look at your main and your jib halyard, I would like them to be brand new and I would buy them from the best rope maker I know who provides the best rope because those things are going to last you the whole trip and consider that. Consider having a spare drum of spectra and think about having the fids and a spare clip so that you can splice up a new halyard or a new, new spinnaker sheet or a new brace or whatever. If you are a boat with a furling jib, Everybody ignores, ignores the furling line. And let me tell you when the furling line breaks at the wrong time, when it's blowing 45 knots and the jib unfurls, that's not the time to find out that you should have replaced the jib furling line. So those of you with furlers in the race, just go and buy a new bit of rope, a new proper bit of rope for that. Um, the big thing that I find sailing two-handed is that you need to mark everything. So mark your halyards for what when it's when the sail is up to the top, because you're doing it by yourself. So you're grinding, and if you can see the mark come out near the winch, you know that the halyards up enough. You don't have to keep looking up and then winding and looking up. Mark sheets and braces so that you can set the sheets and braces for when you're hoisting the spinnaker. You know tack lines, all of those things. Mark them so that you know exactly where they have to be, and all this procedure will make sure that you minimize the mistakes so you minimize the the load and stuff on your sheet so you don't make mistakes again main halyard make sure it's marked on each reef point so when it comes to reefing you let the main halyard down to the mark and then you just go and proceed doing the other steps of the reef and it's easy to do All right, so that's a bit of a broad outline. If anybody would like to ask any questions about what you might do, um, I think that spectra and some friction rings and things will replace any things that you might do, and it's pretty hard to bring anything else for rigging other than make sure it's right before you start. Um, you briefly mentioned hydraulics. Uh, I know that I, I sail on Bacardi, and Bacardi pulled out of this year's Sydney Hobart because the newly reconditioned hydraulic backstay failed, and they really didn't have faith in in you know a manual physical system. So hydraulics get him serviced before you go, and potentially even take a spare. Um, the other thing was that um, you did mention rig checks now. Paul and I, we, we did rig checks I don't know, every week or two. And one of those rig checks, Paul found the D2s were splitting. So we took Spectra and we actually had to jury rig up a, a temporary D2, the, a backup D2. Um, yeah. So, yeah, having that rig, the equipment to check it, and knowing what to check is pretty important. Yeah. So, again, just remember in the whole scheme of things, 
is that you're going 5,000 miles and it's moving all the time, every day, 24 hours a day. And for some of you, it's going to be 40 days and some quicker ones going to be 25 days. But you don't want to spend all this money getting on your campaign for not taking your mast out, giving it 100% of renovation. And if you're not going to replace all your rigging, think about the D2s and the four stay. And particularly the four stay is a classic one because every time the, the boat goes over a wave, the jib loads sideways. And so it just pushes on the four stay and they break easily. Good point. And we had a problem with um, the two to one halides where they chafe out at the top. And the only way to really see that is to go up the rigging and have a, have a good look. Yeah. Um, Rod pointed out you're going 5,000 nautic miles back as well. So don't forget that. Paul yeah. Roberts pointed out, you yeah, you probably a baby stay is a, a good idea, depending on the rig configuration. Yeah. Uh, well, one of the Pete, things I, I would like to see all boats, and it's something that I would have, is that the quality of the sails nowadays and in a jib, four-stay jib, is a really safe thing to go when you're going hard. And so it does the same job as having a baby stay. It's just an inner jib, and it's a useful thing these days. Yeah, Pete Dowdy um, pointed out that halide locks are fantastic because they help you reduce the chafe on the cover of your halides and reduce the compression loads in your rig as well. Yeah, um, so I sail on a boat called Shimmer and uh, we have a lock halide and I must say my first experience of a lock halide is it just has a kind of bullet on the halide and um, you pull it up and it locks in and then to let it off you pull it up again and it comes out and um, yeah the I'll soft, the soft for, jammer things yeah I've, I've sailed on it for three years now and we've used it all the time um, it's a big heavy boat um, and I can say that if you are sailing a boat that's heavy, the main priority for you in this Osaka race is to make sure you can sail somewhere in the light because there's four transition zones that you have to get through. And the faster you get through the light patches, the quicker you'll go in the fast patches. Good point. Um, okay, any other questions? We do need to move on. Thank you, Simon. That was really good. Mm hmm yeah, I try to go quickly because we're out of time. So we, we are out of time. So look, I'm going to take back control. If that's all right. A bit of a control freak. Yeah. Um, just going to remind Ron Stan, we do have the Spencer watch. Um, so remember to get in your orders for that. Thank you to Ron Stan for supporting. We have uh, our clothing sponsor um, via Paul Schultz with Musto and Bollet. So again, consider that and look at your ordering um big thank you to our supporters and sponsors as always that without them we couldn't put on these events um and we certainly couldn't put on a race like this Arca. um just gonna put it open to open question now um broader open questions and i'll just put this last slide while we do it just reminder that the next session is the 10th of july but any broad open questions from the floor before we wrap up tonight We're not getting anyone through. So look, once again, I'd like to thank on behalf of everyone, all the speakers tonight, giving up their time. Um, good luck to everyone. We're going to hang around for another four to five, 10 minutes. Um, if you're done, feel free to drop out of the meeting and we'll speak to you very soon. Well, Martin, just on behalf of the organised committee, thanks again to all the presenters, uh, yourself, Rod, Paul, Simon, and Blake, if you're still there, your father said at lunchtime you would be presenting well. The only thing uh, I uh, occurred to me during your presentation, you were talking about old sails. Uh, my uh, doldrum sails have now done uh, four uh, Osaka races, so they're 20 years old and they're going to be doing the fifth. If I can find out where they are at the moment, I think in, in 2018, they changed on several boats. Uh, I can't recommend uh, the Spinnaker main uh, enough the worst thing in the race to me was the slatting sails in the doldrums. With the spinnaker main, you just drop your main, put put it up. Instead of slatting, it just rustles. So I'm Good. not quite sure where mine's, mine, mine have got to, but if uh, anyone's uh, listening uh, and has them, could you let me know? Is well, it a coincidence if, that Rod is if, attempting to sell? If you want to exactly buy one, that? George, I've got one for sale that's in near perfect condition. It hasn't done four Osakas. It's probably got your sale number, Jorah. It's that's probably, right. yeah. Right, Actually, Mark that. Remington made them for me out of uh, uh, 
spare bits of spinnaker material. So they're very gaily covered, coloured. Uh, <laughs> probably why why they're still used. Um, yeah. Kevin Lepoitian, sorry if I've mucked up your name, Kevin, uh, has pointed out you should take spare buttons. Don't forget your spare buttons. Absolutely. You'd be a bit sad if you needed a button and you forgot them. All right. Well, thanks. Let's wrap up there. Um, and maybe the presenters just hang around and we can